And we're live. I am Botair Basiat, your host of this live stream. These are my two partner in crime, Voluntary Consumer and Alexander the Great. Hey, how you doing? How's it going? Yeah, pretty good. Good. Our, our main topic, and we might have different conversations along this stream continues, is democracy. Uh, oh boy, that's a fun one. <laughs> so, Alex, Alex, uh, what's your what's your thoughts on democracy? Well, uh, just out of curiosity, both of you guys are ANCAPs, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I kind of want to hear what your thoughts are on it first, to be honest, because I, I, I remember correctly, most ANCAPs kind of see democracy as like a tyranny of the majority, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's the exact wording we use for it. <laughs> But yeah, I'd kind of like to hear you guys flesh out on that a little, if you don't mind, first before I kind of jump in. Oh. Eh. Well, I kind of ramble on it. Yeah, Voltaire, you want to go first? Uh, democracy. I uh, come from the Greek word, demos, uh, strong, kratos, well, kratos being strong, demos means people. I thought uh, the stuff I've been reading at first, in like democracy was a strong was used to be seen as an expletive, a bad a bad thing due to the strong majority. We see it as a uh, play to describe it in the Republican, and um, we view democ and cast or libertarians view democracy in its pure form as mob mob rule. No, you know, um, um, it's it's a lot. It allows many many things to happen, even. You know, we don't have mob rule. We have republics or neoliberal democracies, and we can see uh, a, a lot of problems with that as well. Like the mass, like the mass expansion of government, the the intrusion, um, are the slowly taking away people's rights, natural rights away, and more intrusions into the free into the free market enterprise that we love and fetishize so much. Uh, yeah, just about. Uh, if I could expand on that, I think uh, one of the one of the main examples of tyranny of the majority that uh, people use these days, end caps anyway, and libertarians, is uh, nine priests are on a desert island with a little girl. They vote on who gets raped. Does that justify the rape? Yeah, that's, kinda... that's just the that's just the slightly humorous example. Yeah, yeah, I get what you're saying. <laughs> so that, that, that's kind of an interesting way of like putting it, I guess. But um, let's see, I don't really understand the uh, tyranny of the majority kind of thing because um, either of you uh, guys by any chance read uh, the Dictator's Handbook? Um, no. Say again. Uh, sorry, have any of you by any chance uh, read the Dictator's Handbook? No, not yet. Okay, that's one a really good uh, book. I'd recommend you guys read that. Very interesting read. But um, I I don't really see how the, the tyranny of the majority thing is valid. I would say because I'm trying to think of how I want to word this. So in, in the book, it basically talks about how uh, governments are run. You have uh, dictatorships, which are defined as like small coalition, which basically means you know. When, you, when you're in power, you need people to, you know, keep you in power. You need people to back you, like the military and all that, if you follow me. Uh, is that like a CPG Gray's uh, video, Rules for Rulers, where he breaks down that even a dictator has people he depends on to stay in power? Uh, yeah, that's actually that. that's basically the same thing. But, um, yeah, and then you have the uh, large coalition ones, which are democracies, which rely on having people, I guess, uh, the, the people – you know, keep you in power. And one of the things it talks about is that democracy and like large coalition uh, governments kind of force people to run the government in like a, a way that benefits the people. So if you like can look at it, like leaders have to provide basic things like good housing, decent housing conditions, water, uh, more food. And it actually talks about like studies about this. Like you can look in, uh, uh, a good example is, I want to say, New Guinea and Honduras. Like, New Guinea is much uh, a much more richer country, but it's a dictatorship. And if you look at, like, the access to clean water and food, it's, like, 30%. But if you look at, like, Honduras, where 
it's like maybe I think I think their GDP per capita is like a third of New Guinea, but their access to clean water is about ninety percent, and it theorizes that this is because it's a democracy, and it talks about like a study where they found like the correlation between access to clean water and democracy mm. is about twenty percent or something like that. Well, ANCAP's like kind that. of. Ancap's kind of uh, oppose democracy on more of a ideological level than you know. Oh, democracies haven't worked in the past. It, it's sort of like, like for instance, um, let's say sixty percent of America supports I don't know, unfiltered, unregistered monitoring of all American citizens. Sure. You know, just some nineteen eighty four stuff. That doesn't justify the monitoring just because sixty percent or whatever voted for it. Yeah, argumentation ad populum. Right. And that's really the basis of democracy to in the eyes of ANCAPs, at least. I'm not going to speak for. But um, an, another major important thing is uh, the majority, the, 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 the largest group doesn't necessarily have to be over 50 percent. You can still have a minority rule in the majority in a democracy. Like, for instance, um, the largest party in uh, in the U.K., is 27% of the population or something like that? Yeah. They don't – there's five parties. The largest owns about 27%, and they dictate the majority of the laws. Through democracy, it's a minority leading the majority. Okay, yeah, I, I can kind of see that. But So one of the reasons I, I personally like, like democracy is like those reasons that I mentioned before. And then I don't, I don't know. Like I just feel like – I mean, I, I get what you're saying, but I, I feel like you have to. I feel like if, we, if I say this, we're gonna get into a debate more about whether or not like NANCAP society can work. But you know what? You know what I'm saying? Like, you have to prove that like this is a better alternative, I guess. I I I, I kind of get what you're what you're getting at there, uh, but like ideologically speaking, just sticking to democracy, it's probably the best statist argument out there. But it's still flawed on the idea that a collective or a minority can supersede the natural uh, rights of a person. Yeah, yeah, I, I get what you're saying there. And I, I guess. Plus, uh, the, and, uh, also, I think libertarians or ANCAPs don't really care what kind of government is. We tend, I think, we tend to, we tend to measure how economic free a country is. So we don't really care if it's a, a democracy or. Um, or a dictatorship. Well, yeah, a, a lot of uh, libertarians have a blind following of uh, Pinochet, but they, they, but he was a dictator. Wait, is that the helicopter guy? Yeah, that's the helicopter guy. <laughs> the the no Say again. Uh, Pinochet. Is that how you spell? It? That's a, Is that how you pronounce his name? Uh, yeah. Pinochet, it's a soft T, but uh, it, it's a, it's like a, it, it's spelled like you would think it's Pinochet, but it's, yeah. it's pronounced like a soft T. Okay. So I'm, I'm kind of curious, like I got a question that I'd like to pose to you, like in an ANCAP society, like, uh, do you think like people would naturally evolve into like groups that would still basically function as governments though? We just uh, just um under the hoppy and, and ethical capitalist society um uh, people eventually form their own communities and he's the Hans Upper Hopper is the fiscal remove kind of guy you know and yeah. people basically will sign these contracts saying these are the rules of the community as long as you say here's how Hopper here's how Hans Upper Hopper say this. People who advocate for people who advocate for democracy, socialism, syndicalism, and communism shall be physically removed. <laughs> that, that, that always made me laugh. It's it's one of those helicopter meme kind of things. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. If I could add quick, I, I think one of the things that's often misunderstood about anarcho-capitalism is I, I think when people hear the word anarchy, for better or for worse, what comes to mind is just mass lawlessness, people shooting each other in the streets. You know, th that's the idea they have. They hear that word, they just freak out. Under In an ANCAP 
Uh, most, if not all, the services that are traditionally provided by government would be present. So society wouldn't necessarily look a lot different. Ants. It's just that they'd be privately funded instead of, you know, funded by force through taxation. My two cents busting in with a big set with a really good point. So, Thank so, you. So from what I can understand, you're basically saying that, like, there would still kind of be, like, a... a governments almost but like they you'd be more consenting to it like there's no yeah it's voluntary social. no one's gonna no one's gonna throw you in a cage for not paying for security okay yeah. um, just think one well, i think one of the most prob one of my main problem with uh, neoliberal democracies um you know they're more prosperous in today's and current society just just we like as a libertarian we kind of oppose things like progressive taxation and um mm -hmm. and welfare which does cause its cuts which cause a moral hazard a moral hazard as well well that's well more due to the culture of things but i digress on that but that's now i i should mention that uh, it does vary widely from school to school of uh you know libertarianism and and cap ism uh like some people just think that there would be nothing like that and you just have to pay for all your services yourself yeah, it, it really varies depending on who you're talking to. Okay, yeah, I'm starting to kind of get it. Well, so like that, like that guy T, for instance, um, he'd probably tell you that there'd just be a voluntary government, while someone like maybe esoteric entity would be more of the more of the school of you pay for all your services, but competition would drive the services uh, prices so far down that you'd be able to afford them all in the first place. Okay, yeah, so, um, uh, quick question, you guys know that, like, uh, that, that thought experiment with the, um, you know, like, people pay for, like, fire services, and then, like, if you pay, if you pay for your own fire services, you kind of have to pay for the person next to you, and so on and so forth, so that would, that's kind of more of a straw man from what I'm understanding, from what we're hearing you guys talk, I guess. Um, I'm not desperately familiar with that, I, I've heard it mentioned, I'm not... I, I think, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think what you're referring to is what they're saying. Suppose your house lights on fire and you have fire insurance. In yeah. the process, your neighbor's house gets lit on fire. He doesn't have fire insurance. The firefighters are going to show up. Are they going to put out the fire at your house and leave your neighbor to burn because he doesn't have fire insurance? That's kind of is that where you're going with the challenge? Uh, yeah, it's, 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 the way I was trying to pose it is slightly different. It was more like your neighbor's fire, neighbor's house catches fire, and that's a threat to your house. Okay, uh, because I, I think I see what you're getting at. Yeah, yeah. So that, from what I'm understanding, you guys are saying it's more kind of a straw man because there, would there still be like collective things and like these voluntary governments? Or once again, it just really depends on who you're talking to. Like, okay. for instance, if Esoteric Entity were here, he'd probably tell you that uh, the guy who didn't have fire insurance would probably pay to have his fire put out after it gets put out. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I would say, like, qu quickly, no, I have a close friend who works in a hospital. And, like, what he, he says he can confirm all the time is if, if somebody gets rushed into a hospital, dying, doesn't have insurance, the hospital is still going to treat him. And then yeah. on the on the back side, he'll probably have to pay for it. But I mean, they'll work that out after they've saved his life. It's not like they're gonna say, "Oops, sorry, no insurance, not gonna save your life." Yeah, obviously. Yeah, that, it kind of reminds me of that one scene from uh, Breaking Bad. I think it's the very first episode where he's having a heart attack in the in the ambulance, but uh, he's trying to convince them to drop him off because he can't pay for it. Oh, um, I just crashed. Give me a minute. I what, think what's going on? Uh, I think volunteer is, he said he crashed. He has to get back got, on. Got disconnected or something. Yeah. No. Who, whose channel is this? Sorry, on? I was... On yours. Sorry, I was distracted. Wh whose channel is this on, by the way? I, I never asked. Uh, my channel. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, how have you been doing lately? Have you been making any uh, new videos or anything? I haven't talked to you in a bit, actually. 
but I said, how's your channel been doing lately? I haven't really looked at it. Um, I've been doing okay. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't been working on my blog that much lately. I've been busy with classes and everything. I, I got that gun control post, but that's going to take forever to research. Yeah. What's your research so far on gun control? Actually, uh, come and think of it. That reminds me of uh, one of the re- – that reminds me of a bo- podcast that Ben Shapiro had on the Las Vegas, Las Vegas shooting, actually. Um, uh, he said the reason why we don't have a pure, direct democracy – because peop- because the real the majority changes like pretty much every week. The reason why we have a, a a republic is that people can think this through. If we if we have a he said if we have a direct democracy, people will probably ban all guns. Since so we have a republic, pe- people will be um will think about what actually going on. Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, it's, I thought that was a, I thought that was pretty interesting to be honest. Mm. Uh, yeah, but I haven't really done a research yet. I'm reading through a book on statistics just so I know how to interpret stuff better. Uh, I still haven't gotten through that. And then I have about about 10 studies I gotta read and then I'll be able to start writing. Ah, oh, that sounds a lot that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, it sounds awful. Yeah. Yeah, it takes research though. It'll I'm sure it'll be a good product once you're done. Yeah, yeah. Are you like pro gun control? Uh I don't have an opinion on it actually. That's why I'm doing it. I've never looked into it. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll see. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you ever? Have you ever read Hans Eber Hoppe? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Hello. I haven't, yeah. not yet. Um, yeah, Hans Eber Hoppe. You know, he's like kind of like the meme on the libertarian community for advocating physical removal. But I've been reading some of his stuff, and he's he's pretty impressive. I probably should read uh, Democracy: The Guy That Failed because he. Cause he, cause when I read it so far, he explains under a uh, democratic government, politicians, due to their higher time preference, will expand their will expand their government over time, over time. And he said a monarchy would be a much preferable alternative due to you, ideally a king having a much a much lower time preference due to, uh, due to the state being his primary source of in- income. So he wants to um. To um, um, basically make the most money as he can through his privately privately owned government, unlike a public o- publicly owned government, i.e., I- a democratic government. Wait, so he's saying in in, in that book that uh, monarchy, mon- monarchy 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 would be preferable to a uh, democracy. Yeah, that's it's it's the book is like three hundred and thirty pages and. Just so far, is so far I'm reading it is actually pretty good. I, I have to give that a look sometimes. I just kind of disagree with that on the basis of the the large coalition, small coalition thing. This thing just like does that make sense for a uh, democratic politician? Make sense to actually expand the power of the government due to their higher time preference? Uh, not particularly, because like I was saying, like a democracy, from what I've read forces people to kind of run the government in favor of the people. Yes. Based. Government is based, uh, an essentially um, aggressive force. Like, in, like, when you say in favor of the people, that means public opinion should, that the government should do what the people will, do, do, do what people will, right? But is that what you're saying? I mean, I mean, kind of, yeah, but what I'm, what I'm getting at is that, like, you know, in order for a politician, like a democracy, to get votes, he can't just take away, like, he has to provide certain things, like access to clean water, access to food, or else people are going to not vote for him. And then there's, like, another thing, too, like, he has to be able to provide good treatment in, like, in the case of a natural disaster. He, like, you can look at this, too. Uh, there's some study that says, like, democracies, like, they have way less people die in, um is it due to the economic system? Uh, it, it could be. I mean, it, there's a correlation between democracy and uh, just less deaths, I think, during natural disasters. Because they do. Have How to... are they defining democracy, though? They mean, I mean, I, I can't believe that that was talking about pure democracy. I mean, let, 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 me find the, let me find the thing. 
this thing. Just that's the that's the thing. What I'm getting at is happen happen under this hype. Of, I'm just giving a hypothetical. Happen since we have a democratic government and it's kind of forcing the people to do what happens. What happens if they want to? Let's happen. What happened if they want to lynch somebody or take away people guns away? Will they? Will they? Will Will this democratic government will have to do that or just ignore that due to the will of the people? Or I'm just strawmanning you. One second. Let me find, let me find the study real quick. You guys can keep talking about something while I look for it. <sighs> this thing just. Yeah, uh, this might take a bit. One sec. <laughs> no one's gonna answer my question. Well, I'm sorry. Um, can you repeat the question? To it that much. Yeah, repeat the question, please. Okay. Um, you said that um under democratic governments, uh, people be um like the 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 people almost be forcing the government to do what they want, do as they will. Well, I, I, yes, I think that's true. I mean, when you when you to, but that's, sorry, go on. In a pure, the the you have to be careful in these discussions about democracy. I mean, I'm always inclined to talk about you know pure democracy, which is the the majority rules. But I, I can't think of any modern government that actually has a pure democracy. They have the republican form of government with democratic elections of representatives, but. If you, I mean, a pure everyone is from everyone from the founding fathers said that the, the the founding fathers themselves said the problem with pure democracy is it's two wolves and a lamb voting on what's for dinner, and even in in the democratically elected republic, the problem is that as soon as people figure out that they can vote themselves stuff, uh, that that will be the end of the government because uh, once the, once people realize if I vote for this politician, he's promising to give me more free stuff than that politician. Nowadays, whether you're a Democrat, whether you're a Republican, it doesn't matter. If you don't promise people free stuff, you're not going to get elected. And that's one uh, of the, the major problems. The we tragedy have. Of, uh, the tragedy yeah, of the comments. comments. I forgot about the trash. That's probably one of the biggest criticisms of modern democracy is the tragedy of the comments, actually. I'm not familiar with that. The tragedy of the commons. Mm -mm. Um, okay, in simple terms, under a resource economy, and like uh, my two cents said, when people want something more of it, and when a singular entity wants it, like say a government will give that to give that to to a certain a certain group of people. People say, "I want more. I want more. I want more free stuff. I want want I want more ta progressive taxation on the on the one percent." And that's that's the thing. That's the well, in simple terms, the tragedy of the commons. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I just what it's in my one of my most recent videos called "What Is Democratic Socialism?" That was the point I was making. Is if the, I mean, the, right currently in America, the lowest income bracket pays no income tax whatsoever. But if you think about it, when they vote, they can they vote. If, you know, they vote for someone like Bernie Sanders. People who pay no income tax at all are voting to raise the taxes on those that do pay income tax. I mean, in what in what world does that sound? I mean, and, and it makes sense because they want free stuff. But you know, as as in what world does that make sense? How does that sound fair? It's yeah. not fair. Oh, uh, happy to voluntary consumer. Uh, I I just saw on Twitter he said, "Darn the Texas Wi-Fi." Ha! Um, That's pretty. Okay, I think I'm in the sucks. section of the book where it talks about. It. I, I'm still looking for it. Sorry. I've been I've been bringing esoteric entity. He wants to join. I believe yeah. he said he did. Yeah, about sixteen minutes ago, he said he did. Cool. Yes. So what's so, so? Do you think our? Go ahead. Like you think our uh, Alexander? You think <laughs> our problem with our democracy is more so on a? superficial level if anything else i mean my problem with it is one like you, you'd have to like convince me because you, you know me I, i'm a statist um you'd have to basically convince me that one an ancap society can work and two I, i'm still the, the voluntary government thing still gets me like i don't see what's preventing a tragedy of the commons from happening like in a voluntary government is it just the difference that you're like technically consenting to it that's 
Well, yes, there's that, but you also they, there can be no initiation of force against the citizens by the government. If I mean, with taxation, I mean, t taxation is just a legalized form of theft. And I've I've it's heard so people try to I mean, if you try to argue against this, but think about it. If somebody holds a gun to your head and says, give me your money, that's called theft. If you don't pay your taxes, men with guns come and take it from you. Now, you, there are some, you, you certainly can argue that it's a necessary evil, and some people do argue that, but nonetheless, taxation is theft. I think the difference would be in an ANCAP society, no one could be forced to pay if they didn't want to. And because if they did, uh, yeah, because it's voluntary. So what, what prevents a tragedy of the commons? Well, the fact that you can't steal from people even if you vote to do it. Wait, couldn't people just consent to being taxed, though? I'm, I'm still not wrapping my head around this. I'm, I'm well, sorry, consent, that, that, that's called paying for a service. I mean, if, if I pay for, if, if I consent to being taxed, I mean, that, that means I'm voluntarily giving my money to someone in exchange for a service. So that's not taxation. That's just, you know, the exchange of goods in a free market. So, so okay, so by the way you're def defining... Um, uh, like paying for a service, you're basically saying like, say you have like a, a voluntary government and then you like consent to being taxed to provide services. You're, even if those services don't go to you, that's still what you would say is buying like a product almost. If the services don't go to you, what, 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 what services are you referring to that you are, you're, uh, what I hear there is you're saying there are some services you'd be voluntarily paying for, even though you didn't use them. What, what would that be? Uh, like say, um, like uh, in a voluntary government, say you have like a community fire thing, firefighting, but you don't ever use that, but you're still like paying into it because you're consenting. Well, yes, I, I think that that would be ideally. I mean, we don't want our houses on fire. We so we wouldn't want to have to use it, but it's. I mean, you pay for it so that you're covered beforehand. I mean, in a voluntary society, if you didn't pay for pay for the fire department and they had a bit, uh, you know, save you anyways, then you'd have to pay on the back end. And it would be okay, more expensive. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah, we, I think we talked about that earlier, I guess. Yeah. It's just... Yeah. So I, I think I'm seeing what you're saying a little. I'd say the consequences are pretty harsh for tax, for taxation. Yeah. Yeah get a, a lien on and if you uh, don't pay that then uh, there will be like um, another warning or something and then um, or, or uh, awesome. men with guns may uh, come to your house also here's a other uh, problem with uh, democracy um well well it's a it's the thing um, so like the, the I, it's got me thinking about social justice which is Sort of like Democrat, democratic justice. Uh, I just got a book called "The Housing Boom and Bust" by Thomas Sowell, and he's he stated that it's due to Republicans who are trying to push more housing on the on onto the people on the people, you know. And well, we all know what happened after the after the fact. What's going on? Oh, are you talking about the housing crisis? Or yeah. Hang on, quick. Uh, Esoteric's in here. Uh, let's quick rephrase what the question, what question we're discussing, so that he can jump in. They're just discussing about democracy, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Oh, uh, or no. whether it's the best form. Well, yeah, but you were talking about the O eight housing crisis. I think. Yeah, that that happened due to due to the I. That's happened when you. That's what that the housing bubble, the housing boom and bust. Thing. That happens due to people trying to figure out these people deserve uh, housing. These uh, egalitarian, this egalitarian thinking. That's, that's uh, no, it, it absolutely wasn't. It was caused by uh, I, I forgot what the law was called, but yeah, it was caused by a uh, a, a law signed a bill signed into law which allowed for. Uh, banks to take out loans which they didn't have to uh, back up well so. technically it, it, re it required bank if i'm not mistaken it required banks to give out loans to people even if they didn't have the necessary credit to be, uh, to be able to pay them back and that essentially yeah and f f 
the gov the government run Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae essentially said if the if the loans go bad, the government will bail you out. Yeah, exactly. Uh, That's and it it happened up to that. the point in like it was like two or three banks failed and they did bail them out. But then it was I think it was Lehman Brothers failed. The government did not bail them out. And then when it, when everyone saw that they didn't get bailed out, uh, the, a bank run ensued. Everyone was afraid more banks were going to fail. And, you know, they ran off to take all their money out of the bank. All the banks said, I mean, holy cow, there's going to be a... Sorry, I just like, just uh, what this book, I, what I'm book I have right now, the house and boom and bust, he said that is due, is more suit, is more due to the our, our Congress trying to push, push more people into housing people, well, into more housing. Well, yeah. That's a very oversimplified explanation of it, but yeah, that's essentially what it was. I know, and you can look up like President Bush's speeches several years prior, talking about how I, you know every we need to help Americans get homes, and that's kind of I, and I agree with esoteric. He's saying that's oversimplified, but I mean that's how they sold it. We, yeah, we need to get. Yeah, just that's the, that's the thing, though. No? Yeah. Oh, just. Uh, so how's everybody day so far? Pretty I got good. to go to work in like a half hour, so. Mm. Okay. Well, I just got, I was traveling for the past few days, so it's good to be home. Yeah. Yeah, I got home not too long ago from being out food shopping. Also, uh, well, <laughs> the reason the reason why I started this stream because I've been called a fascist, a sexist, <laughs> because I've been called a fascist, a sexist when I say I don't believe in democracy. I well, in today's day and age, you'll get called a fascist and a sexist if you're not a liberal, no matter what. Yeah, so. I don't think there's a single person here. Even uh, Alex over there has probably been called a fascist, and I don't even know what he believes. He's just here. Uh, I think that he's not a social justice warrior. Also, I've been called a sexist because I said women shouldn't vote. Well, nobody should vote, so. Yeah, it's just... But, but the funny thing is, if in a in a social justice society, even if somebody says, even if for some reason the government said women shouldn't vote, shouldn't the SJW say, fine, all we have to do is identify as men when we go to the polls, and then we can identify whatever we want. After, right? <laughs> well, that's, that's exactly the fucking point. What, like, in a democracy, what happens to the people who say, uh, I don't want to vote, or uh, I don't in a direct democracy, or I don't think there should be a system uh, that's in place that, you know, allows people to control my entire life through a majority vote. Oh, well, then, you know, it's not, it, it's so easy to poke holes in, demo, in democracy as a quote unquote free system that I honestly, I, I actually, just, I actually, just one of the biggest. Holes. Most people just haven't put much thought into it, I think. Actually, yeah, I mean, one of the biggest lies of a, a democracy that somehow creates the freedom. You know, admittedly, I have to admit that people who have neoliberal democracies tend to be more economically more free than other countries, but but not but democracy in itself does not create the freedom. Like I said it's before, not the used, democracy. well, not the freedom that yeah. they think they want. It's not the democracy that makes their society um, more prosperous. In fact, the democracy is the direct threat to the society's prosperity. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Just, just maybe this. The only, maybe we, the only freedom that um, voters really have is the freedom to oppress each other. Yeah, That's and I think I try. I, I mean, I'm trying to. I'm, I'm trying to think of – there's a quote from one of the founding fathers. I can't remember which one, but it's prior to the American Revolution when they were discussing whether or not to revolt against Great Britain. Someone posed the question. They said, why should I trade one tyrant 3,000 miles away for 3,000 tyrants less than a mile away? And yeah, it's, it's, that's, I mean, that's a good that's point. A good point. I think the book – I think um, – the philosopher who just completely killed democracy as a concept, like he absolutely put the nail in the coffin, was, of course, Lysander Spooner. Yeah. No treason. I mean, no treason just killed democracy. There's no, I mean, after you read that, there's just no argument for it anymore. Yeah. Just, I mean, what's not Lys only. What's Lysander Spooner? What's Lysander's argument? 
Well, his argument is not only, you know, what was just proposed here, but it's also that democracy in and of itself is not a voluntary system because in a system of mob rule, you know, the people, the majority who assumes the rule, um, you know, since they, they are allowed to rule by that very nature, what you're doing is you're allowing a majority to uh, defy the self-ownership of a entire group of people, therefore enslaving the people who are not the majority who lost in the vote. So even so not only is it not um, free, but it's also not voluntary because he also exposed he also proposed the concept of like a de of a defense vote. Some people uh, vote to try and defend their rights, but of course that's. Also, also just it seems like more democratic governments tend to pervert their constitutions more often, more often or not. Well, that that wasn't his point. His I point, mean, like I'm I'm just I just add in that point. His point was that okay, for example. Um, if I'm on my property and, you know, I want to have a certain number of trees on my property, but somebody uh, proposes a city ordinance and town hall that says uh, there can only be a certain number of trees in people's yards and uh, the amount of trees I want to put in my yard would exceed what the city ordinance uh, says people can have in their yards. Well, that would be a law directly in defiance to my property rights and my property rights stem from self-ownership so say that law okay gets passed okay um well now i'm being oppressed by the majority vote because my self-ownership has been denied uh can i jump in real quick of course um so mm -hmm. this is a little slightly off topic but you, you remember how we were talking about these uh these sort of voluntary governments I'm still not understanding like, what what could prevent what what what's supposed to prevent those from de eventually devolving into like mob rule by any chance? Yes. Okay. Uh, t quick answer to your question. I I think what so you're saying, and in, in uh, you you still keep using the term voluntary government. I, I I think that's kind of an oxymoron. But you're saying in an ANCAP society, what yeah, that, prevents that's, it that's from? What I'm referring to. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. What what prevents it from devolving into mob rule? Yeah. Okay. Well, I would answer to to answer the question. I think one thing I do want to be careful about is I I I think like communists are very common very, will very commonly present their argument like saying if we just went if we just adopted a communist society everything would be perfect. And I think unfortunately some people view ANCAPs as thinking if we just had an ANCAP society everything would be perfect. I mean I I believe an ANCAP society is much preferable to what we have although. I do admit it wouldn't be perfect and there would be inherent dangers. One inherent danger of an ANCAP society is that if the people get lazy and stop protecting their, uh, their personal rights, then yes, a, a government could take over. So I guess the, the weakness of an ANCAP society is it does depend on people taking their property rights seriously and protecting themselves from oppressors. If, if, if people just got lazy and stopped doing that, then yes, the society would be overrun but that's that's the thing with an ANCAP society though is that as a society it sort of forces you to not be lazy and mm -hmm. it forces you to look out for yourself so I mean I think I, I just, what were you saying Sorry. I think that for a civilized people to exist we need um, there would have to be room for both people who are both compassionate and intelligent. One virtue without the other brings disaster. Well, so um, I, so I, just um, and cash society me uh, need to be a high trust society. That's what you're saying. Well, um, I think well, uh, it depends on exactly what danger to the society you're talking about. Because the danger to the society that's uh, sort of ambiguous. But um, to be fair, he did uh, lay out specifically like it's a mob rule taking over well yeah. i mean the thing that you need to that this argument doesn't take into account is something called an emergent property which has and can be observed empirically and that is when um 
people essentially form a voluntary uh, sort of collective of a group in uh, self-defense in this case based on combined self-interest and then would uh, quickly disband. So effect, So to put it simply, um, let's say, for example, a tyrant uh, did uh, em emerge. A corporation managed to amass an army of about 10,000 people. And uh, we'll say the entire world is ANCAP in this situation, uh, just for because this is assuming this is this is a fully anarchist society. Um, well, it's, that okay. that corporation, that one entity with like ten thousand soldiers, would be up against billions of people. Billions. So, the when you take emergent properties into consideration, um, your are the the argument just. It falls apart due to sheer impracticality. Mm -hmm. And like what, I, like I was saying earlier, the only way that tyrant, you know, his corporation could succeed <laughs> if the people didn't fight back. But I don't. In an ANCAP, like Esoteric was saying, in an ANCAP society, it would already be well understood you have a right to defend yourself. So unless he could somehow succeed in scaring billions of people into thinking they shouldn't fight back. And admittedly, I, uh, I mean, I, in theory, that's possible, but I can't see how he'd be able to succeed at doing it. So, there's billions of us, well, and there's a few thousand of them, so <laughs> it's it's really yeah, not. Yeah, strength in numbers. I don't, I don't see what's preventing, like, uh, see, what I'm not understanding is, like, how the issue of, like, democracy cannot, like, apply to that same situation. Like, so say uh, you were saying that just in case I don't, I don't want to scroll manual esoteric, but you were saying that there's nothing to keep to, for those corporations to convince people to not fight back. You were saying that? Well, no, no that was me. That was, I, I was saying that if the, if the tyrant who had risen in Ankapistan, if somebody wants to essentially overthrow Ankapistan and create and put himself in charge, create a new state, the only way he could do that is if he had enough force to overcome people defending themselves, protecting their property rights. Now, I said, in theory, if he could somehow convince everyone that he's so big and tough that if they try to fight back, they'll just lose their lives so that everybody you know, voluntarily gives him their stuff, I mean, then, yes, he could successfully overthrow the ANCAP society and install himself as a dictator. But what I'm saying is I can't imagine, in an ANCAP society, I can't imagine how he would do that because everyone would be armed. Everyone would know they have the right to defend themselves against the initiation of force. And there's thousands, like Esoteric was saying, there's thousands of them. There's billions of everyone else. And even even if we want to scale that down, a smaller ANCAP society, there's a hundred of them and there's a thousand of everyone else. The point still stands. Well, no. What's what's preventing the tyrant from like just convincing them that they'll just provide stuff for them if they just let them govern? I guess that's th this is the issue you guys have with democracy. I still don't see how that doesn't apply to an, uh, to an ANCAP society. Well, I, I I see your point, but my my question to you is how would he do that in a society where everyone has you know the right to self ownership, the right to their own property? They don't have to. I mean, they don't. Well, he would have to convince them that. They need him for some reason that they shouldn't fight back. And I'm, I'm asking you, uh, yes, that's possible in theory, but how would he do it? What would he do to convince them just voluntarily give him their rights? I'm, I'm really thinking of how I want to phrase this. Um, it, it just seems like the, it would almost happen exactly like you would see in a democracy. Like they just said, oh, the rich is up against you. The, the greedy capitalist uh, will take money from the rich and provide for the poor. Something like that. I mean, I don't see how that still just wouldn't apply to a... Like, are you just worried that par paratism is just going to happen in Kapistan? I'm, I'm sorry, that what would happen? Like, paratism? Because you, know, you seem like you're oh, describing that. Sorry. Re uh, re re repeat the question one more time. Are you just worried about par paratism? Uh, I'm not exactly 100% sure what you mean by that. Like, parasites, like, um... I just you're just saying that an anarcho capitalist will anarcho capitalist stand will be uh, more vulnerable to more corruption. Uh, oh, yeah, no, you I, know, I don't think an ancap society will get rid of that problem. Is what I'm saying. I th okay, are are you saying there will still be lazy people who would rather receive welfare than work? Is that what you're saying? Basically, yeah. 
Okay, well, what I would say to that is, and in, I think how and the, the, the problem in our society is people can get away with being lazy because they'll receive welfare. Even if they, even if they, uh, well, like one thing that was just shown in Alabama, they, under the Obama administration, there was requirements for who they had welfare to. After the Obama administration ended, Alabama instituted a change in their uh, food stamps policy. And basically what it said was, if you are an able-bodied working, you are an able-bodied adult without dependents, you, in other words, if you are fully capable of working, you know, you had to have, have a job, but still demonstrate that you needed food stamps. After they did that, food stamps rolls dropped 85%. So what that says is that 85% of the people who were on food stamps weren't on food stamps because they couldn't find a job. They were on food stamps because they were choosing not to work so that they could receive welfare. And in ANCAP society, basically, here's how it works. Either you contribute to society or you starve. I mean, if in an ANCAP society, you would have the freedom to just sit on your butt and do nothing if that's what you wanted to do, but you would also starve to death. And I feel like the self, basically self-interest would compel people to work because they couldn't get away with being lazy. Well, and I kind of disagree that like a worker starve thing would exist in an ANCAP society because I mean uh, there would have there probably be some form of private charity. Well, so, sir, I mean there would like, be private charities, but I mean it would be so up to those private charity. They would make their own rules. It wouldn't be government mandated about who gets money. So what's to prevent people from like being dependent on those and then one not contributing to society and then two wanting more of that from say a state. Okay, well, they would. What prevents them become, from becoming dependent on the private charity? That would be up to the private charity. Like, if if I run a private charity, it's to me to decide who gets money. If if I voluntarily give my money to a lazy person who doesn't want to work, that's on me. If I I, I just keep giving money to lazy people when they saw they weren't trying to get a job, they weren't. I mean, it wouldn't be to help them get back on their feet. They're just living off of it. I don't think they'd continue giving money to such a person, but even if they did, that's on them, not anyone else. Um, and and it, it, was there another part to your question? Yeah, so I was saying, okay, so you, you answered the part about, um, I forget what, oh, one, one second, I just lost my train of thought. Mm, oh, yeah, so okay. um, you, you answered my question about what like is to prevent uh, people from being dependent on private charity you, you you answered that question but my second part of the question was what's to prevent those people from wanting like more of that from say a state like uh, i i still am not wrapping my head around how this problem would be solved in ancapistan by any chance well they might want it but they wouldn't the only way they could achieve it is by initiating force against someone else they'd have to steal it themselves since there's no government to do it for them and as soon as they did that they violate the nap well yeah, so that's what I was saying back in my theoretical. Like, if a, if a government was trying to take over, and you, you were saying they, the only way they could do that is if they could convince people not to fight. I mean, what I was saying is they could convince people not to fight by just making promises and saying, oh, we'll provide free stuff. Um, well, I, I guess the point, uh, all I'm going to say to that is I think and to some degree, that's a valid criticism in, in that if if they could do that, then they would succeed. I just don't think that in an, an ANCAP society would lend itself to that en enough people like that being produced to for them to Sorry. be successful. I was at lunch. Uh, what, what was said? Okay, but basically, uh, well, first the question was asked. In an and was it was brought up would it would private charities still exist in an ANCAP society and the answer was yes, so then the question was asked well what would prevent people who didn't want to work from becoming dependent on private charities just like they are on welfare, and my answer to that was well, I mean in theory that could happen but the difference is a private charity. If I run a private charity, it's up to me to decide who gets money. So if I see a lazy person just mooching off the charity, I can choose to cut him off. If I yeah, don't exactly. choose to cut him off, that's on me. It's you know I I could choose I could choose to do that, but I'm not taking other people's money and allowing people to mooch. It's my money. All right. All and then, right. But then so and then sort of like yeah, yeah. you can go ahead and ask your next question again. The question you you just answered or. Yeah. After that, you ask another question. So just bring oh, to yeah, bring yeah. Yeah. My, my second, like follow up to that was, um, what is preventing those people from wanting like more welfare from a uh, government trying to take over? So this is how I was saying, like how a government could take over. Is you were saying that 
the government would have to convince people like not to fight back or be able to take over. And you said, you know, obviously it's going to be hard for them to take over by force. So I, I rebutted by saying that they could just honestly, there's nothing preventing them from just convincing people who want more free stuff, I guess, <coughs> to not well, fight back. Oh, um, I'm seeing more free stuff, I guess. If yeah, sure. the difference um, between the explanation of an emergent property and a democracy is that um, in a democracy, the system in and of itself fun uh, functions based on a uh, system of mob rule. In a emergent property, um, the mob collective, whatever you want to call it, forms as a direct consequence of something threatening that group of people's uh, bottom line, th their lifestyle. So it's not a system, it's not a uh, systemic thing. It's not something which would exist as a system. It's like, for example, do you remember the, I, I don't remember, I think it was Delta Airlines, wh whichever one it was where uh, they beat up that doctor and threw him off. I think it was United. Oh yeah. Yeah, United. Uh, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it bad that I laugh when he just screamed? <laughs> so um, yeah, United <laughs> Airlines that and then you know people took their business elsewhere in other words they voted with their dollar well uh, voting with their wallet is an example of an emergent property at least when it comes to the market uh but yeah we've seen like with the american revolution uh emergent properties definitely have existed in the past before where people do um things which uh, don't have like there is sort of there they are individual people but they group together in response to something all threatening their lifestyle in the exact same way okay so th that's that's the distinction between a democracy and an emergent property so um I think the idea that a government can form out of emergent property is, uh, is uh, it just doesn't make any sense. No, that, that wasn't my point. My point was that a, um, a government trying to take over, like, uh, let me make sure I understand this. So if a government tried to take over, you're saying that an emergent property would, like, prevent that, like, it would fight back against that. Yeah, pretty much. Okay, so my point was trying to say that What's to prevent a government from just being able to convince the emergent property to never form in the first place? Like, so if I was example saying, like, uh, the government could just convince people, like, hey, if you let us take over, we'll provide free stuff to you. Like, I don't see what's preventing that from happening. And that, that's the, it, the same issue you guys have with democracy. And I don't see how anarcho capitalism can fix that. That's what I'm saying. Okay. And I, I think may, maybe. I think you've put your finger on the fact that I don't think any of us would ever claim that an ANCAP society is completely immune from overthrow. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, yeah. in, in, uh, in, in, in theory, that could happen. But what Esoteric is trying to explain to you is it would be in an ANCAP, the way an ANCAP society is structured would make that so incredibly difficult that it's not likely that it would happen. Is it possible that it could happen? I suppose. But uh, I think... Uh, people in an ANCAP society understand their value, their freedom. It won't happen, um, uh, even if, even if in theory it could happen. I, I don't know. I think you're just. I, I think you're making the assumption that people would just know that they have that they would value their freedom. I, I think that's that entire argument is just based on an assumption. If, if you get what I'm saying. Okay, but I think and but but yours is based on an assumption as well. So the question would just be. Um, yeah. it, it, is it? Well, there's a difference. Um, I mean, there are. There's. You have to consider the kind of assumption that's being made. Um, is it a baseless assumption or an assumption cre uh, created by a logical inference? And that the argument uh, that the anarcho-capitalist society there would value their freedom is not a baseless assertion. And it's one that's founded on a logical inference that, you know, for the society to exist, people have to be independent and they would see all well, their societies developing at a greater rate compared to all that of human history. 
education and, would have to improve um, a lot. Well, I mean, it, it just it's it would because in that society, uh, education has a incentive behind it. But anyway, and the point that I was getting at warfare out of it. And, and um, assumptions like the one that you're making that a government is just going to form and convince people that um, anarcho-capitalism is a bad thing. Well, I mean, that's the yeah, power it's, of that excuse. Entirely, it's entirely possible that that could happen. But, you know, oh, what, what is the base move. for um, what's the base for that happening? Like what? is going to lead one to believe that that will happen or that, uh, you know, something won't happen to stop that. Well, nothing. So it's sort of, an, it's a baseless assumption, essentially. And that well, sort of goes, that's, that's sort of the same with a lot of uh, these outlandish uh, arguments against it. Like, oh, there's just going to be um, an army that's going to take everyone over or like, like uh, there's gonna be uh, Acme missiles fired at everybody. <laughs> I, I I don't think there's ever uh, anyone's ever proposed that, but um, <laughs> I mean it, it it gets that bad sometimes with how uh, how far some statist arguments have to stretch. And I think empirical evidence against that is, uh, you know, after the collapse of the USSR, their pl their hypothetical plans for invading the United States were declassified. And what it turned out was that the Soviet generals, not a single plan to invade the United States involved crossing the state line into Texas. And they specifically said the reason they wouldn't go about invading the United States was even a fully armed mechanized Soviet brigade would suffer too heavy losses because Texans are so well armed. So, yeah. I, I mean, I'd say that's empirical evidence that when you've got a free armed society, even the strongest army is afraid. Yeah. Possibly. But, uh, again, I, I would say that's also dependent on the fact that people would want to work to get, uh, would work together, like specifically work together, I guess, to, to fight off this offending army. Like, I don't I mean, see how, like, there wouldn't be, like, groups that would be in fighting while this army was trying to invade, I guess. Mm hmm. All right. Well, I'm sorry, but I gotta go. It's time. I gotta go to work. So, see you. Yeah, have a good day. At work. It's about four thirty. Uh, yeah, I'm probably gonna have to drop out too. Cause I mean, we're kind of just getting the rabbit hole right now. So. Okay. Well, I would say, um, if 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 this is getting yeah. to the end, I think you've. I'm I'm gonna say I, I think you've raised some valid points. But what what I would say is the next time we have a discussion like this, if you can, um. If it gets put together some empirical examples, you know, like actual historical examples that lead you to believe that this is, you know, because this happened in such and such society, you think this shows very strongly that this would happen almost immediately in an ANCAP society or inevitably in an ANCAP society, whichever you prefer to argue for. Okay, yeah, sure, definitely. I mean, that'll probably have to be in a while because I'm working on my gun control post, but... Um, Problem. Yeah. I, I guess I, I'm still, I, I'm at the moment uh, looking through my list of, I, I tr I'm... I try to keep up my schedule three videos a week. Uh, I maybe I'll uh, make one talking about some of the things you proposed. We'll we'll see. I've got a few things in my to do, but okay, yeah, we can. Uh, this is this is Steve. So, this is Soldier. Uh, awesome, yeah. Resident Evil fan. Hello. Thank you. Hey. Hello. What's your thoughts on democracy, Hello. dude? Oh, it's been also it's been a while. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's been about a month. I just moved to a new place. How's your how's your life, dude? It'll be a lot better. Let's just say that. Uh, sorry, man. What's your thoughts on democracy, dude? Well, as I said before, I think we talked about this before. I don't think it's a good idea. I think if you want freedom and if you're going to have a government system, not an anarchist system, which, I, which, really which I'm in not a... Chat. The best way is a, is a republic, not a democracy. So I think a democracy is a is a is ultimate failure. Yeah, just the, it's just in just democracy. Well, is really is a failure along with republics because because it's because it always got pervert because the state must maintain existence by perverting. The foundation that set on a private example I'm thinking of the United States of America is because I honestly think the founding fathers will be 
disgusting how big the American government is. Oh, they absolutely would. If you read the Federalist Papers, this, what we've got today is absolutely the very things they were trying to prevent. But I, I would say quick about on the issue of republics, I think republics retain the same problems democracy does. They simply slow down how fast it erodes. Yeah, the, yeah, it's the problem of decivilization with democracy. You get a quicker the decivilization effect, but republic is just slow down the inevitable. Mm -hmm. Well, it also depends. And it, well, it also depends what kind of republic do you want. What about what about a Roman Republic? No. No. How yeah, bad? No. How bad was a Roman Republic was? Almost as bad as the Empire. Oh. Uh, did you what what republic you suggest in my live chat? A free market republic or a Birkin style republic? You know, Edmund Burke, a, a Birkin conservative style republic. You know I'm a conservative, right? I'm not an ANCAP. I know, I know. Don't get me wrong. If we were to go into an anarchist society, I would obviously choose the anarcho-capitalist society because I've argued with ANCOMs and it just doesn't make any sense. Like, why would you have communism, which is complete totalitarianism, and anarchism, which is no government whatsoever? Why would you want to put those two together? Yeah. Leftists and their uh, habit of taking two different viewpoints and trying to combine them together. Yeah, and I'd say leftists have too high of an opinion of humanity. I mean, I, I think uh, in anarcho-communism could only work if everyone was the if everyone in the society was completely selfless, completely morally good. You know, could think of nothing but how he might help his neighbor. I mean, if, if that was a society, then maybe it would work. But, I mean, get real. That's, that's just the thing, not that's, us. that's the thing with uh, leftist mindsets. This it's just the egalitarianism. That's probably that's probably one of the most problems with democracy. When you have politicians like Bernie Sanders promoting egalitarianism or social justice, that's kind of that's kind of lead the downfall of society because you are creating a moral hazard and a yeah, actually, a horrible culture. A bunch of caring idiots. <laughs> yeah. It's like you can't have you can't have anarchism and communism at the same time because they both because like I know people had this argument like back and forth. Well, you need a government to have one, a government to have the other. Well, the thing is, if you want like social justice and wealth redistribution. I seriously doubt that can be achieved without a government. Like, even if it were to be achieved, not that it, you know, not that it, that ever successfully happens. When you look at Mao's China or Stalin's USSR or whatever. Yeah, yeah Mao's China is definitely what's definitely is a disaster. <laughs> yeah. Well, but be careful how you say that. Say what? How you talk about Mao. Mao's China was a disaster. It's it was. Possibly, quite possibly one of the most humanitarian crises that the world had ever seen in the 20th century. And the guy killed more people than what Hitler and Joseph Stalin combined. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's funny. Would... Ever, I've always, I've always been amazed. You know, Hitler was evil. I will give you that. But you know, Hitler killed six million Jews. But if you look at Stalin, Mao, and Pol Pot. Collectively, they murdered more than a hundred million. So Hitler pales in comparison. When you, yeah. this is why I think fascism is, is a lesser of two evil compared to communism. I hate them both. Mm -hmm. Me too. Yeah. I lost. I lost. I lost family to the swastika. I lost family to the rope. Yeah. The same. Just also just. I know. Like, just like lynchings, like in that isn't that democracy right there? A lynch mob. Yep. Yeah, I said but my my favorite quote is democracy is two wolves and a lamb voting on what's for dinner. Just like that's the thing. Um, this is that's the thing with most uh, commies or Marxists because they think that people are gonna vote what they consider to be the best for the collective. But the thing is, the reality is, um, uh, the mo people and yeah, democracy will vote with their self interests. Yep. Mm -hmm. Which is why. Ca 
self-interest is the universal reality that makes capitalism the only workable economic system because it's the only system where your self-interest forces you to serve other people's self-interest. Another thing about a republic, as I was saying earlier, is like I said, I know some people who, cra who claim for they're for democracy may claim they're for it, but they don't seem to be as concerned. Like whereas republics, well, maybe it's just because I talk to, you know, small government constitutionalists in America. They talk about the best thing about a republic is that unlike democracies where if the entire country says so, then that's it. Like, for example, like when elect, when you have elections, whatever the popular vote says, that's what's important. Like, it doesn't matter what this small town here thinks, what it all matters, what the people in New York and LA think. It doesn't matter what the people in Carlisle, Ohio think. Yeah. Just, that's why we got the electoral college. But thank God. Yeah. But, but it seems like people who want democracy or, you know, like the majority rule, it seems like that's what they think elections should be all about. So it's like, OK, well, the people of New York and Los Angeles and Chicago, all three major cities want this. But what about all these little small towns that oh, yeah, don't want Andy, it? Well, it's just the, 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 the funny thing is, though, I mean, so. Donald Trump wins the 2016 election and suddenly all the liberals are like, the electoral college is stupid. We need the popular vote. But God knows if Donald Trump had won the popular vote, but Hillary Clinton had won the electoral college, they would have been singing the praises about how wonderful the electoral college is and why we need it in America. Or they blame Russia. Just, yeah, or they blame Russia. I mean, it's... Oh, uh, well, we all, uh, uh, never mind. I was well, going to... Well, to be honest, the, the Russian narrative hacking is, is a joke. Oh, well, here's what I will say. Here, here's what I will say about Russia. Like, if let, let's just say they did have something to do with the election, I can I can guarantee you it was not in favor for Donald Trump. It was probably more in favor for Hillary. Main reason why is because she sold uranium to them. So, or, so. if you listen to Nero Roman, is lot they all say that's Russian propaganda. Yeah. yeah, it's funny. The the first video I put on YouTube a couple months ago was called "Why Is Russian Meddling a Big Deal?" And the point I made in that was, I guarantee you, every country in the world that has some sort of vested interest in the United States of America did something to try and influence the election, whether it was just put out a message that tried to sway American voters, or whether it was downright messing with it. But I mean, get real. The, Sau the Saudis donated millions of dollars to the Clinton Foundation. How was that not, not quote unquote, meddling based on this, uh, this, this definition that the media has been using? It's just ridiculous. Yeah. This thing is like, I never did believe in this narrative, and it seemed like it's a boring like conspiracy theory. See, Atomic Ancap has just joined us. Hello. And I said, you should not join my stream. What's up, Ann Are you still there? Hey, you, you there? Hello? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, which is the best kind of republics? Um, what about a John Locke Republic Republican-style government? I would just say an Edmund Burke-style republic or a constitutional republic, a limited government. But why, not, a, uh, why not a Roman republic, though? That seems uh, kind of cool. Okay. That's, that seems kind of cool, actually. Well, I think it's just because, like, just given that it became, like, I don't know. I guess like, it's because I, I guess it's because I, I, I focus too much on the empire than the republic. I mean, it's not that I know. It's not that I know more about the empire than the republic. It's just like, yeah, but it's like, kind of like, not that I'm saying it's kind of like it ended up leading to an empire, and that's just kind of how it is. Also, under democratic governments, I'd like to point out um, their foreign policy tend to be different compared to a how monarchy. So? How so? Um, just um. Like, if you read Democracy, The God or Fail, Watch, or a truly sound video, Monarchy and Democracy, uh, 
democratic governments tend to have a more interventionist policy than anything else. Just the expansionist policy or police action. Uh, under a monarch, uh, uh, they view under a monarch. Um, if my memory is correct, uh, truly, Tom and Hans Ever Hopper said that the monarch will have a more emotional interest in the soldiers, and they view them, and they view them. They want and they want the war as quickly as possible because due to the loss of human life and more the loss of well their income. Yeah. Um. I guess I could see that. I, I'd be interested to see some data. Yeah, you can watch through the sound video or read Democracy, the guy that failed by Hans and Hoppe. You got some data. Okay. Yeah. Any thoughts on that, Seal Drift 7? Uh, no. Uh, and I, I wanted to quick say the thought I had about knowing more about the Roman Empire than the Roman Republic. I think most people know more about the Roman Empire than the Roman Republic just because their transition to empire is what made them famous. Kind of reminds yeah. me. Of, it kind of reminds me of Star Wars, actually. Yeah, because you know you can blame government schools if you want to. I don't know if you want to, but uh, when I we should, studied when, when we studied Rome in school, where I went to school, we didn't focus too much on the Republic, but we did focus a lot on the Empire. Yeah, I wonder how complicated Roman politics were back then. I don't know. Maybe that's another thing because it did seem pretty complicated when I was looking at when we were studying it. I was like, this don't make sense. Yeah. Our politics don't make any sense right now. So just. No, it doesn't. <laughs> like, yeah. That's, 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 that's it the used, thing. Like, it's it the, used it's to. Like that's the thing. Politics always been either always in theater since the since the formation of government. Mm -hmm. And you know that's what I think. Like I said, the weakness of a, a republic is that it still retains the problems of democracy. It just happens slower. I mean, I believe the founding fathers <laughs> the founding fathers believed in a small government with only a few specifically enumerated powers. And for the first hundred years of American history, we had that. The problem is, after Woodrow Wilson's presidency, he fundamentally changed the way people thought about the federal government, in that prior to Woodrow Wilson, the federal reserve, people, yeah, well, yeah, the federal oh, reserve, man, the federal but, was but, but, but state from the beginning. Sorry, yeah, for Oh, it yeah, was, but I'm saying bro more broader, Woodrow Wilson, prior to Woodrow Wilson, it was commonly understood that the federal government only has those powers that are explicitly granted to it in the Constitution. Woodrow Wilson <laughs> changed that. His philosophy was, if the Constitution does not explicitly forbid the federal government from having a power, then the federal government has it. And that's how he went on by, ju went by justifying the Federal Reserve and everything else he did. Like that's, that's the only reason why he got away with it because the Federal Reserve is still I mean, technically considered to be a private bank. Yeah, private banking cartel. Yeah, it's a private banking cartel. It's, I mean, that's how they've managed to avoid audit all these years. They say we're not a government agency, so we're not subject to Freedom of Information Act requests. This, that's the thing. We could just we could just end the legal tenders and bring back the gold standard and have a decentralized banking system. I mean, that's is that simple? Is oh that yeah. Simple? And that will. Do we include silver? Plus, plus that will shrink the government so dramatically. Why do you think they able to have? Why do you think they able to sustain these foreign policies, these military, these disasters, economic disasters? Who it's said something about silver? Uh, I did. Okay, yeah, I, I think we could, and it's even when we were on the quote-unquote gold standard, the U.S. Treasury s still maintained vaults of silver. So yes. This thing. That's the only reason why. That's the only reason why we had big military in the first place. It's due to the Federal Reserve making money out in there. Mm -hmm. Military oh. industrial complex. And the sad thing. The sad thing is that um, one. If we even do that, if we do right. that, we hey, it'd be a miracle. Because, well, Ron Paul tried to do that like multiple times, but he was ignored. Yeah. And you have I, I left I left his wagon. And just like imagine if we just end legal tenders to the Federal Reserve and have a decentralized banking system, a free banking system with a universal gold standard or precious metals, the government be so much smaller and society be more prosperous. Oh yeah, exactly. JFK <laughs> was saying the same thing before his head got blown up. Oh, I wonder why.
But uh, then LBJ came along and, and Richard Nixon came along as well. I wish I, had, I wish I had that on tape. Actually, I like Richard, actually, I like Richard Nixon. I thought he's interesting. He's a Keynesian, so I wouldn't recommend his economic policies. I know. Like, the thing is, he's not Richard. I give this to Richard Nixon. Um, he was a highly affected politician. That's the thing. He's very effective as a politician. Oh yeah, he was, no doubt about it. Like yeah, he like he was very pragmatic, knowing what he was trying to do. But I think he, like one, he met they messed up with his monetary policy. Um, I think you said that reopening relationship with China was a mistake. I said that. I think you said that, or. Oh oh yeah yeah I think it was yeah. <laughs> Like, it's just so, like, um, why did Nixon do that, actually? Well, I don't know. I think it was because, well, I mean, you could argue other different kinds of reasons. Um, I remember watching a documentary on, because, uh, cause, you know, I used to want to go to the military. I, I think I told you that, but for health reasons, that's not possible. Um, I was studying the Vietnam War. Apparently, what happens is, there was belief, we're not sure, that he was trying to talk to China, well, trying to get China to, like, get North Vietnam to, like, you know, like, to, like, stop doing all their aggression and everything, but that didn't work, because even despite both being communist countries, you, you go to the history between Vietnam and China, those two countries hated each other for thousands of years. The hate. That makes that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it, it, it's funny because uh, I remember when uh, <laughs> um, Jason Anuru, you all know who that is, right? That guy deserved to be shot or physically removed. <laughs> I remember he made a video because not because Vietnam and China to this day still don't like each other that much very well. To a certain extent, they still do because they're both communist countries, technically. But uh, he made a video of a few years ago when Vietnam was doing uh, military drills or something. And he was like saying, Vietnam and China, you two used to be brothers and capitalism tore you apart. And I'm like, what? I mean, first, first of all, these are communist, these are communist countries. Okay, number one, I was like, number one, these are communist countries run by communist yeah. parties. And number two, number two, the hatred for these two countries go back thousands of years. Plus, plus if my memory is correct, I think the Chinese, I think the Chinese culture kind of have a test for merchants, actually. And like I said, the hatred for these two countries go back thousands of years because China used to rule parts of Vietnam and then the Vietnamese like kicked them out and they're like, oh, now we hate each other now. <laughs> no, that's 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 the crazy. That's the thing. That's that's the funny. That's the funniest thing I ever heard today. But yeah, another thing you said about Nixon and China, did you say something about his war policy you thought was wrong? Hey, his monetary policy, but... Yeah, it, well, well, like, I think, like, how he handled the Vietnam War. I mean, yeah, I know it was LBJ who got us into it, but I just think, like, even if you wanted to get out, I just think his his version of getting out was uh, was not was probably not the best idea. This, this. I can't believe Jason Unruh said, said that capitalism drove these towards the, tore these countries apart. No, it's, just, it's due to culture differences. Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, half the time they seem the same, except for the food. Like, <laughs> they, well, they eat like this thing called pho in Vietnam. I've had it once. It's, uh, it's all right, I guess, just without the spicy stuff. Yeah, I heard Vietnam is still horribly poor. Yeah. I mean, oh, they, wait, that's, they, due to, that's due to state capitalism, though. Well, they did kind of did what China did with Deng Xiaoping in the 80s, but I wouldn't call them like, oh, this great economic success. No, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that. No. Yeah, just due to like four, I think it's due to like nearly 40 years, near, nearly 30 years of socialist policies. <laughs> I know. But no, that's, yeah. but no, that's not real. Socialism. It's socialism is the workers 
control I I kind of hate that definition. It's so narrow. Yeah. Like I well, kind of I kind of hate that definition of socialism because for one, it's centralized control over the means. definition of socialism again. The workers' controls and the means of production. Yeah, um, you, you know, I, I, I under socialists who like the hardcore socialists who say that's the real definition of socialism. I understand where they're coming from, but by the same token, quote unquote democratic socialism, where you have a market economy, but and just like redivide the money so that everybody has the same. That might not be owning the means of production, but it still seeks to achieve the same end as socialism. So oh, I just I just find socialism as the root as the. Just a, I think socialism at its core just essentially planned economy. Yeah, essentially planned economy. And you all know that many socialists will go out their way no matter what it takes to make sure that national socialism is not socialism. Mm -hmm. It is. Even if it's not, still, it has the same amount of collectivism. So I'm sorry, guys. I love Scotty M. Well, I'm not, I'm not just talking about his videos, but like when you face it, even if let's say it wasn't socialism, um, Nazism and fascism, let's say they weren't socialism, which they are. They all come from socialists, socialism. Yes. They, have, they have socialist roots. But the thing is, let's say they weren't. They still share the same amount of collectivism as communism, basically. And that's the thing, another thing I wanted to talk about since we were just talking about Vietnam. Uh, and we're just talking about, well, that's not true socialism. It's kind of funny because, um, like, because a lot of people say, well, Hitler wasn't, uh, Hitler was right wing because he was nationalistic and he was anti communist. Well, okay, well, in, in the Vietnam War, everybody knows communist North Vietnam, and then there was the Republic of Vietnam, South Vietnam, which was the republic we were helping. Uh, most of the South Vietnamese uh, leaders and the political parties in South Vietnam, they weren't, um, some of them were socialists, like, not like Marxist-Leninist socialists, but like European-style socialism, social democracy, those kind of things. Hmm. Hang, hang on quick. Uh, I, I just got to say, uh, this has been awesome. I, I got to take off. Voltaire, thanks for having me, and hopefully we can all talk again. Bye, right. two cents. Bye. See you later. But like that's what I was saying. Like self. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, I uh, I just want you to keep on going. Well, no, that's what I was trying to say. Like, so wait a minute. Like, if you're an, if you're nationalistic and anti-communist, that doesn't mean that doesn't make you that doesn't mean you can't be a socialist or left wing or anything. That's the thing. Uh, one of the main arguments saying that Hitler is a right winger because he hated the. Bolsheviks and the Marx and the Marxists, but just but but if you notice, if you if you go through history, socialism has been around way before communism. Just really, like, communism, like communism. Actually, communism, um, sorry, actually sorry. communism been around since ancient since the ancient Greece. The idea of socialism, anyway, been around since ancient Greece. Well, that's like the thing. Like they like to say, well, capitalism did this in the ancient times did that no it didn't because like both socialism and communism both of them have been around like socialism and capitalism i mean they've been around for like what a few hundred years like capitalism for example it's only been around for like a few hundred years but corporations and privatization that thing's been around for thousands of years so you can't just say well because a lot of socialists like to make the argument, well, if you're for privatization, you're automatically a capitalist. No, no, it doesn't. Because China did had did implement some privatization, and even under the Soviet Union after Stalin, but they were pretty heavily socialist. Yeah, like that's what I was like trying to say. Like a like like they try to say, well. Like, 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 like I was just talking about the Vietnam War, North Vietnam and South Vietnam. They think, well, all South Vietnam is anti-communist and they're backed by the U.S. So us, obviously they must be a capitalist country. No, they weren't. If anything, they were a mixed economy. They were basically a social market economy. That's the thing. Like China, like, you know, I don't consider China to be capitalist. It's still, to me, it's still pretty <laughs> socialist. Like in, yeah. it's, in its economy plus their economy, you know. This is why I think uh, 
this is why I would kind of laugh at the neocons worry about China invading. Um, their economy and their army and their society is really crappy. It's so it's such crap. Plus, their economy is still heavily unstable. It's still unstable. Well, hopefully their military is not like what it used to be in the Korean War. <laughs> because, oh. it, I mean, yeah, they didn't have, like, advanced weapons like they do now, like they did back then. But back then, they were just able to just, like, charge over a hill with thousands of guys in the Korean I think they, War. I think, they still, I think they still can do that, actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But that's what it was like in Korea. Like, they would, like, use guerrilla tactics to, like, sneak up upon us undetected. And before we know it, we see a bunch of guys coming down a hill. Banzai! And all, and all we can do, that's Japanese. I know, but <laughs> I, view Asian, I view all Asian cultures to be the same, so call me racist. Well, well I, could, I could explain the differences, but that'll probably take too long. Don't care. That's Don't. okay. But just for the record, the nunchucks, if you want it, are not Chinese. I uh, know they're Japanese. Well, you could say Japanese now, but they were invented in Okinawa, which at the time was like known as Rikyu or, or the kingdom, the Rikyu kingdom. Yeah. Because Japan, because Okinawa, it's now part of Japan, but the Japanese, it used to be its own country, then Japan invaded it. Uh, I forgot how perilous Japan was. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, um, just, it seemed like the Chinese culture, well, it seemed like the Chinese culture or itself is, is still pretty anti-capitalist, because... Because if my memory is correct, they didn't really like merchants. They view merchants very lowly. Plus, um, I call China like a almost like a neo feudalist, a neo feudalistic society because it still it still doesn't allow because it still it still takes a long time to get out of poverty because I because I really hate to be poor in China of all places. Yeah, excuse me, I'm coughing some stuff up. Just, just, like, like one of the like if you can tell if a country is more prosperous, just just take a look at their economic freedom index. Yeah. Well, yeah, you could make the argument that China is not known for being capitalist. Like, and here's another thing that socialists like to argue: they like to call Chiang Kai Shek a capitalist and the KMT capitalists. Because they were anti-communists and they're backed by the United States. Well, they still exist today, but now they're a political party in Taiwan. But the thing is, when they all started, when they first started, um, the 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 first the founders like Sun Yat-sen, Chiang Kai-shek, and all those other people, they were they were socialists, but they weren't they weren't Karl Marx socialists. They were like at least they weren't retarded. They they were they were like they were I wouldn't say national socialists because they weren't like oh we're pure we're the pure the Chinese are the pure race well maybe they were I they it just didn't seem like they advocated for that but they were for nationalism and socialism and so forth and like they were like a national socialism like nationalist socialism and I'll just say that instead national socialism. All right, they're also but, different type of capitalism. Well, I mean, um, like, I consider myself a capitalist, but like, I'm not. But I'm not a libertarian or an ANCAP. I'm a conservative. I don't know. Or you can call me a center rightist. Sometimes I don't know what I am, but I, but you can either say I'm a center rightist, an M a Birkin conservative, or a. I don't know. I can say we're supposed to be like a paleo libertarian or a conservative. Nah, I used to be a libertarian because here's the thing. Up until I was 18, I would I identified myself with the Democratic Party. I was never registered a Democrat or anything, but because I came from a mostly Democrat family, that's kind of what I associated myself with. But as I got it older, and like I said, I guess I was never a very good Democrat to begin with because I was always for like the right to bear arms and everything. I mean, like, yeah, sure, there was one point where I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm for the right to bear arms, but maybe we could like do something about banning fully automatics. But 
I'm completely over that. I'm 100% pro gun now, so you don't have to worry. So when it comes to gun policies, you got nothing to fear from me because I'm pro gun. But what happened was is when I was about 18, I went from being a Democrat to a libertarian. But then I kind of realized I wasn't really liked by other libertarians. They just accused me of being a fake libertarian. They even called me a neocon. Like, I'm like, why would you call me a neocon? Why, why not just call me a conservative? And then uh, then, then some of the social policy, my social policies, which I didn't think too much about, started to kick in. That's why I kind of went over towards more towards conservatism. Well, so, what's your social policies? Well, I'm pro-life. I'm sorry to, to those that are pro-choice. I'm pro-life. Every libertarian should be pro pro life. Um. Well, I guess gay marriage is okay. I don't got a problem with gay marriage. Me neither. But, but as long as like you know they don't force the church to marry them, as long as they keep it out of the church and all that stuff, I'm okay with that. If the I church, agree with you. If the church wants to marry them, fine, but don't force the church to marry you if they don't want to. But like, cause, cause I do consider myself Christian as well. Um, is immigration a social policy? Cause like, there's some people who say it's not. I'm like, yeah, it is. I'm like, yes, I'm against illegal immigration. I don't care if you want to come here, as long as you can speak the language. You don't have to speak it completely. Just speak enough to get by and. Is long, and and you also cannot be carrying any contagious diseases like Ebola. Like I remember that, I remember back back in 2014 there was that guy who came over here from West Africa. He had Ebola and he just wandered around Dallas, Texas, and he eventually died from it. And who knows what he was touching the entire time he was here? I mean, that's contagious. So like, yeah, if I get called a bigoted for saying I don't want people who can't speak the language and are carrying contagious diseases that are deadly, I don't want those people coming over here. You want to call me a bigot? Go ahead. I don't care. I don't know. Like most of your policies seem like pretty libertarian, actually. And yeah. I'm, a, I'm a little bit I, – I'm kind of 50-50 on drug policies. I'm for ending the war on drugs, but as legalizing drugs, yeah, I'm not going to say – Yeah, I'm you told one, Oh, yeah, you told me about that. Yeah, I mean, like, some I may be open-minded to, but others, no, I'm sorry. Mm. Like, one drugs definitely should be legalized. Marijuana. Well, like I said, it it's known as the gateway to uh, other drugs. But like I said, I guess to a certain extent it's okay, but I just think, like, I don't know. Maybe, oh, yeah. maybe I'll just have to. Maybe, like you said, maybe I'll just have to come down to a libertarian thing, an individual responsibility thing. But at the same time, I just don't think legalizing drugs, especially just all at once, is is not a good idea. Even if it is a good, definitely even definitely not good. Definitely not all at once. I know, because like where I grew up, I mean, I I grew up. Well, the town I grew up in, where I just moved from uh, last month, I just moved to another place. I lived there for 20 years. It was mostly okay, a couple bad neighborhoods, but the town right next to us, we had the small town next to us, it was known for high drug, for high drug abuses and like people were like literally fighting each other over over that sh over this shit. Like people would get high, people would be on drugs and do all type of crazy shit. Excuse me, I have a phone call. What's your thoughts on the war on drugs? Me? Yeah. Well, the war on drugs kills more people than drugs do. Yeah. My thoughts on the war on drugs. I think it I think it, I think the policy was designed to get more votes and and um, to also disenfranchise many minority communities. I'll be back in a minute. I'm just, uh, I'm a, I just got a phone call. I'll be back in just a few minutes. No worries. Where did soldiers stay? Huh? Where did soldiers stay?
Spike, is he wait, is he coming back? Yeah, he's got a phone call. No. Oh, he, he like, I was I was just saying that um that the war that I'm just saying that I just saying that policy was designed to get garner more votes. And what just, about still, it's, what about the drug cartels within the government? What are your thoughts like on the that? CIA? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, it's, uh, if they, if well, they should be transparent about it, and they probably should end it because, for some reason, our government is more moral than other people, and just. It's the same, just the idea of government should be more moral than other people, more virtuous than other people. They should they should stop doing that to set a example that us little people can follow. Yeah. Then again, I'd be highly sarcastic and I'm not surprised by this. <laughs> okay. Sorry sorry about that. I, would, I had a telephone call. Yeah. It totally oh, it happens, dude. Yeah, it's life. What I miss. Oh, we just talking about the war on drugs and what these policies were designed to do. Uh, well, like I said, if you want to end the war on drugs, I'm fine with that for the most part. Just depends on just depends on the situation. Like I know, like some terrorist organizations, like they're op they they they're, they run operations through drugs. Some terrorist organizations do that. Um, what about government institutions like the CIA? What do I think of the CIA? Like they're yeah. selling drugs. Yeah. No, I, I don't. I, I don't endorse that. No, I don't. I mean, unless if it, unless if it's like undercover work where they have to pretend to be drug cartels in order to like get to other drug cartels to take them down. Unless if it's something like that, I I can't endorse that. I can't really endorse dirty work unless if it's really really necessary because i understand i mean i understand like like i said I'm, I'm not i'm not in the spy business i'm not in the cia or anything i get the fact that the spy business is a dirty business because that's just oh, the fact that's the fact it doesn't matter what if it's cia kgb whatever it's a dirty business at the end of the day yeah. i understand that but at the same time I don't. I don't think that means we should endorse every single dirty trick in the book. Is all I'm saying. Uh, I, I, it should only be used if really necessary. Like if it was like a do or die situation. Like we got to do. We got to use dirty tactics. Otherwise, we may not get information on a nuclear weapon that could explode in in a week from now. Well, if it was like something like that, yes, the gloves are off. Do what you gotta do. Uh, that means should we invade Russia then if we found some information that they plan to attack America? No. I don't see why. Uh -huh. I would say I would say let the Ukrainians do it. <laughs> oh man. Oh, speaking speaking of Russia, what's going on? With, what's going on with Ukraine now? I've been keeping up with it. Uh. Not much, not much lately. I mean, I actually looked into it. Uh, really, really not too much. Um, like, as for the fighting, if that's what you mean, uh, not not too much. Like, what I heard from uh, Luis Marrero, that that the the population was welcoming was re welcoming from welcoming the Russian the Russians army. <laughs> well. Depends on, I guess it depends on what kind of, what part of Ukraine he, he was talking about. If he's talking about all of Ukraine, no. Oh, the West, the, the West, Western and Central Ukraine despise the Russians. And it's not just Ukraine, like pretty much every, almost every, almost every Eastern European nation hates the Russians. That makes sense because they were under an iron current for like nearly a half a century. No, not just the Soviet Union, but the Russian Empire as well, and that's kind of what I think of Vladimir Putin. I, I like, do kind of, I do kind of think of him as as an imperialist. Like, yeah, he may not be like advocating imperialism now, but a part of me thinks that, yeah, he wants to rebuild the Russian Empire. Like, he wants like he wants Poland back. He wants Finland back. He wants the Baltics back. He wants 
He wants Belarus back. I think I feel like he does want them all back. Yeah, it's just like I think like uh what about NATO? Is NATO just is the only thing that prevented him to doing that? Well, uh, I I I don't know, dude. Like I think like another I think I I've, I've always advocated for this like for a military policy like I was just thinking about this like I think since if Russia and China are a problem for us I think one of the best things we could do right now is get in between their legs if you know what I mean Well some NATO some NATO saw they exist then Well 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 yeah but but uh, on, but, but what I'm dismantle, dismantle what, NATO what I mean is, it's like get in between their legs, like if the country that that's between Russia and China, Mongolia, oh. aka hey. the land of Genghis Khan. Just uh, what's your just um? That's the thing. Um, I don't, you know, I don't trust the Russian government, but that's the thing. I think I think the ultimate goal of the Russian government is see the NATO the to be dismantled so they can do what they want and when they want to yeah th- which is why i don't this is why i don't trust putin i mean i'm not saying i'm really fond of nato nowadays because i feel like a lot of changes because i feel like it's not that i think that nato's useless i just feel like you know it it, it, it definitely needs a lot of changes and I think a problem. The problem with NATO is that I think I think that you know it, it also has to run certain things by the European Union, which we all know that's trouble right there. Like, no, the European Union and NATO shouldn't have to collaborate on any single thing because isn't the European Union like a world government experiment? No, but they try to get people to join them. Luckily, the yeah. Swiss the Swiss don't want to be Switzerland doesn't want to be part of the EU and all that stuff. But like the thing is, is what the EU doesn't understand, NATO is not made up of just European nations. It's made up of the United States and Canada. Hmm. Yeah. So it's like we shouldn't have because like the NATO headquarters is where the EU headquarters is, and I'm kind of like, uh, can we find a new headquarters for NATO? And here's another thing, like. I think that you know I don't know what the gun policies are like in po- are like in Poland or Ukraine or the Eastern European countries, but I think like let's say if the Russian Empire, if Putin does really try to bring back the Russian Empire and he does expand in the other countries, I think like you know we should try to like maybe influence you know I don't know what the gun policies are like in the rest of the European nations, but I think like they That's should. Pretty fit. They should advocate if they if they don't if they have strict gun laws they should probably allow more they should probably like kind of loosen that allow more gun laws maybe even train uh, Polish civilians in guerrilla warfare in case if the Russians decide they want to take back Poland and rebuild the Russian Empire. Oh, I think there's going to be other election in Russia or Poland. It's like that's uh, world politics are so confusing and complicated. Mm-hmm. Yes, they are. Why we can't just why we can't just support free trade and voluntary transaction among businesses and mind their and have our nations mind their own damn business? Well, yeah, that's a problem. That's kind of why I'm not really completely libertarian or ANCAP. I mean, yes, I agree. Free trade would be. I think free trade is a much better way for peace, but it's kind of like, you ever seen that movie, The Dark Knight? Yeah. Remember that one scene where uh, where Bruce Wayne, he's like saying, criminals are not complicated. We just have to figure out what he's after. He's talking about the Joker, and then Alfred says, technically, this is a man I don't think you fully understand. And he was talking about like his time in Burma, how he was supposed to go look for some jewelry or something like that. Apparently, the bandit who stole him threw him away. He just wanted to steal him for fun, and that's and that's and that's the problem. And that's kind of why war is always going to exist, no matter what. Is like the the part is where Alfred in the movie where he says, 
some men can't be bought, bullied, or negotiated with. Some men just want to watch the world burn. Well, and, that, but and that's true. And that's true because you got too many people out there who they will just – they don't care about free trade. They don't care about what you want. They will do whatever they want, and they will do whatever it takes to get it, it even if they have to use violence. That's just a known fact. I don't know why, but you're always going to have those kind of create those kind of insanity around. You're, you're right. You're right. I agree with you. I you know. I mean, that's I know. I, I mean, I, I. That's why I. That's why I consider myself a semi-interventionist, not a pure, not a not a fully intervention, interventionist or a non-interventionist. But my I'm thing not. is, let these if these countries, these nations, want to go to war, let them destroy themselves. I know, but my question is: is like, is this country like a problem with us? Like, if this country barks threats at us, but at the same time, there there's this hey, other country. At the same time, there's this other country that wants to go to war. Because, like, the, for the non-interventionist principle, I'm for sometimes, but for sometimes, I am for interventionism. Depending just, on the depending on the situation. Yeah, that's the thing. That's always that always have to be dependent dependent on the situation. I, I'm I, I guess I'm what you would call a semi someone who's half and who's pro and anti half. Like I'm not I'm not completely pro war, but I'm not completely anti war either. You're just a centrist. Yes, on on international policies when it comes to the military. Yes, like. So, like when people ask me, should we have, should we be over here? Should we be over here? Sometimes I'll say yes. Sometimes I will say no. Like for places like because of North Korea and China, I would say yes. I do think there is somewhat of a necessity to stay in Japan and South Korea. Like I actually, I actually I support a strong military invention intervention for North Korea. Yeah, and like because. It's, it's got nothing to do about more reason. It's just, it's just North Korea. Just, just. It's just a danger to South and and South Korea and Japan. You know, I know yeah. that their nuclear powers is crap, but well, really, we gotta draw the line, Sam. Yeah, well, the thing is, the KPA, the 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 hostile nations of the KPA include the United States, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Australia, and New Zealand. So yeah, we do need to. Uh, I think it would be best to make sure we have a strong alignment with all those countries. Like, and I do think we should, and like I said, I think we do need to maybe try to like improve our relations with Mongolia because who remembers, when was the last time uh, an American diplomat or politician visited Mongolia? Actually, I rarely hear anything about Mongolia in the news. Yeah, but the thing is, the Mongolians, I don't think they like the Chinese or the, well, they don't like the Chinese, definitely, but they don't like the Russians that much either. Some of them don't. They, they, that they makes that makes sense that Mongolians don't like the Chinese. I know. Well, the Mongols ruled China. The Mongols used to rule China, but then eventually the yeah, Chinese the, the Chinese turned the tables on them when the when China became the Manchu dynasty. Cuz then oh. they end up ruling Mongolia. <laughs> so just like that hate hate relationship yeah, it's like, you know, you got all these Eastern European countries that hate Russia. You got all these Asian countries that hate China. It's like, I what think, the fuck? I think, I think every Asian country hates China. Yeah, almost, just about. The South Koreans, like, except for North Korea, maybe, and I guess Russia. If I mean, because Russia is technically both part of Europe and Asia, so... Unless you want to count Russia as the, the Asian part of Russia, I don't know. Like, um, that's the thing. Is I think I, th I, I, I think at, I think at this point, um, I think at this point that the the Chinese government are getting tired of, getting tired of North Korea. Yeah. Oh, and that's another thing. Improve our relations with India because they they have a large military and they're the second largest country in the world. Actually, they should take a more active role in the war on terror. And, and what? 
Well, there's actually been some border recently. There's been some border clashes between the Chinese and the Russians, but nothing big. I uh, remember not, back. And not enough to start a war war? No. Dang it. Oh, do you want a world war? <laughs> no. I just want to see China and Russia des destroy each other. Well, China and Russia destroying each other, like, that would, like, benefit us. That would technically benefit us as long as we stood out of it. Just like, yeah, let the Russians and the Chinese kill each other. Yeah. The two well, most corrupt, yeah, the two most corrupt governments finding each other. Yay. Yeah. Then again, you can't really call, like, China, say it's China and Russia fighting. It's it's Russia fighting the Communist Party because when you think about it, the People's Liberation Army, which is the Chinese military, everything is run by the Chinese Communist Party. It's not – It's not, nothing is the official thing of China. It's always – the official thing of the Communist Party, like the People's Liberation Army, it's not. It's not China's national army. It's the army of the Communist Party. It literally says itself. It, it, it pledges. It's not China's national army. It's the Communist Party's army. Yeah. Same. And same thing in North Korea. It the the Korean People's Army, Communist Party. Actually, they stand consistently. They have like the fourth or fifth most active army in the world. North Korea. Yeah. Well, it has believed that they may have done some secret work in like the Middle East. North Koreans. Mm. Yeah. Well, some say that they're digging ditches in Syria, which I don't know if that's true or not. I I don't see I don't see the self interest in that. Well. The the North Koreans consider well, I guess because since they're allies with Iran, they consider Israel to be an enemy too, because they're an enemy of Iran, which well, is which is another country I'm worried about. Iran, ISIS, and Iran; those are my big concerns of the Middle why East. Why you worry about Iran? Well, because they chant death to America, and yeah, I can see why once you overthrow their leader. Yeah, but uh, that was thirty. Eight years ago, I mean, granted, I'm not trying to make excuses, but at the same time, I just don't think it's fair for future generations to pay the penalty. So I, uh, don't, I, like, I don't support military intervention in, in Iran. And another problem is, is yes, they literally claim that they want to nuke us. And if you remember before Obama left office, he and John Kerry and the Iran deal, which, rem like, not, which reminds I'm me. Not, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm not really worried about Iran obtaining nuclear weapons. I'm not worried about that. I actually am, since Barack Obama kind of helped them already. <laughs> like, well, I, I just think I'm just like I don't like if they attain nuclear weapons. I don't see them using them because one, they have to face NATO and Israel. In the United States, they gotta face the entire world if they do develop nuclear weapons. Yeah, but and, we also have, we also have to remember. The their allies with Beijing and Moscow, Moscow. That's that's that's, that's the thing. Why would they want to fire a nuclear weapon? That's the mutually assured destruction. Just plus, you know, there's still doubt about it. I also have, also, I think Israel got nuclear weapons, but this is not confirmed by anyone. Uh, I don't know. We might as well just give it to them and say, hey. If you two need to fight it out, just do it already. <laughs> plus, what, plus what I can tell, I think Iran only oxidized enough nuclear materials for medical reactors. Like, it's really expensive to build a nuclear bomb. Yeah, but the thing is, is they could still give it to the terrorist organizations they fund. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, let's destroy. One thing I hope is that they're completely they will completely d dismantle ISIS. Yeah. Well, ISIS, Iran, yeah, the, the Taliban, yeah, those those are a problem. When did the Mongol Oh, wait. I I'm reading I read them live chat. Jin Jesus said intervention the intervention in D DPRK would be a disaster. The whole country would be a hostage hostage situation. I don't, I, I don't know, just, I, just think, I don't know about that, Jim Jesus, because 
because I'm tired of North Korea playing this political, political game of chicken, and, they, and these people kind of deserve to be liberated from a oppressive regime. Do you think you think that um, North Korea is just gonna give themselves peacefully, or should we just leave North Korea to be another example of the failure of socialism or communism? Well, uh, well, we all know it's a failure. There's no doubt about that. But as for this, uh, it, it, what's he gonna do next? As for that, what's he gonna do next? Are we gonna react or not? Part of me is just kind of like I've heard enough talk already. Like, are we gonna do something or not? Like, that's the thing. That's the thing. Like, because you, because like this thing, because I think it's it's pretty clear to say this dude is crazier than his dad. We all thought he was gonna be more moderate and more friendly because he was educated in the West, but obviously not. Oh, this, I I just don't know just who. I don't know what to do in that situation. Just I know I support mil a military intervention in North Korea because because they're just they're just a they're just a existential threat to relations to relations all over the world. You ever heard of the Bay of Pigs invasion? Yeah. You ever heard of the North Korean People's Liberation Front? No. Well, apparent. Okay. Well, there are group. It's a group of North Korean defectors in South Korea who are mostly um, former North Korean military, former North Korean police officers, former, I guess even some of them are probably even secret police as well. So like my suggestion is, is like they always make this vow, how they, they want to over return and overthrow the Kim dynasty. So I'm just kind of like, okay, let's just give them the weapons and training. Let them do what happened in Bay of Pigs, except hopefully this time, It'll be successful. Uh, that way, hmm, Bay of Pigs. Uh, uh, the reason why it didn't work out so well is because it, it's because everybody knew about it. Castro knew about it. It was it, it wasn't it wasn't kept secret enough, and they picked one of the worst places to land. This was a place Castro knew. Castro used to spend fishing trips here. He used to take vacations in this place. Kind of glad that Castro is dead. Yeah, but the thing is, is like, if you if you're gonna, it's like, it's like if you try to break into my house, you try to break into somebody's house, but you choose the one place they spend most of their time at in their house, and they and let's say they have a gun, um, yeah, I don't think it's best to rob somebody when they're in the place they spend most of their time in to enter that way. Mm. This, 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 this. That's I know, it's, I know, I know, I, I know. I'm, I know, I'm mixing my words up. I know I'm not making sense a little bit, but yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. It's like, yeah, if you're trying to fight somebody in a place that they know, that they know a lot about, that they know a lot about this place, and obviously you're gonna have the outcomes may not be the way you want them. Yeah, I just. <laughs> Even if, and, even if, it, even if it succeeded, even even if it was, even if we, even if the Bay of Pigs succeeded, still, I mean, it would have been like. Yeah, I think I'm about to end the. I think I'm about to end the bot pro, the broadcast. Okay. Uh, hope you enjoy the broadcast, people, and hope you like and subscribe to my channel. Peace. Yeah. Thanks.